disseminated on uh, ferro cement and uh, thin reinforced cement composites. Uh, today, we are very really honored to have uh, Professor uh, Naaman uh, from the uh, University of uh, Michigan uh, to give us this uh, talk. And uh, Professor Naaman is now uh, with the department uh, as the uh, Warhart uh, Distinguished uh, Visiting Chair Professor. And uh, we are glad, uh, we, we would like to thank uh, Warhart uh, Private Limited for uh, the, uh, 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 the, the sponsorship. Okay, so uh, today, uh, uh, let me give a brief uh, introduction. It, uh, I think most of you have already met uh, Professor Naaman. Uh, he has given a lecture uh, last week uh, on UHPC. And uh, I, I, will be, uh, I will give the, uh, I will just briefly uh, introduce him now. Okay, so Professor uh, Norman is Professor Emeritus at the University of uh, Michigan at uh, Ann Arbor, uh, USA. Uh, he, he holds a diploma engineer uh, degree from ECP. Uh, that's the most prestigious uh, university in uh, uh, France. And uh, he got his uh, Master of Science and uh, PhD degrees uh, in civil engineering from uh, MIT, uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology. So Professor Naman's research uh, studies, uh, he actually worked on many areas. And uh, uh, this has led to more than 350 publications. They're all are very uh, <coughs> uh, distinguished uh, publications in uh, technical journals and uh, symposium proceedings. And, uh, uh, for this, he has uh, received many uh, awards. Okay, so I, uh, I, 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 I think uh, you may want to know uh, in more details about the uh, exactly. Uh, I will get, I will just need to read. So he, he's the author of three textbooks and four chapters in handbooks, an editor or co-editor of fourteen symposia uh, books, and uh, one of his book is a textbook on ferro cement. And uh, this has been a classic in the industry. So, uh, okay, so Professor uh, Bauman is also a fellow and honorary member of the American uh, Concrete Institute, fellow of the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, fellow of the uh, Big Hush Distress Concrete Institute, and fellow as well as founding member and uh, past president of the International Fellow Cement Society. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Naaman to uh, give his uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tan. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, it is, of course, my pleasure to talk about a subject that has been at heart with me for uh, several decades. And the title is uh, Ferro Cement and Thin Reinforced Cement Composites from Lambeau to Nervi to the present. Now, a quickly overview. Lambeau is the first inventor of reinforced concrete, of ferro cement, but it's also reinforced concrete. Uh, Nervi is a famous uh, engineer, architect, scientist uh, that promoted the use of ferro cement in about uh, during World War II, so about 1845. And he is credited for the modern scientific uh, approach to using ferro cement and to the present. And uh, if I can raise a pointer. Where, what, what do I get the next slide with this? How do I get the next slide with this uh, pointer here? I can't. I have to use here. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. All right. So first, I would like to acknowledge the support of the National University of Singapore and the CE Department, uh, the support of the Hoha uh, Consulting Company uh, for uh, helping uh, with my uh, uh, expenses to come here. Uh, I have many, many thanks for my colleague, uh, Professor Tan, who, with whom we organized this course, uh, the, Federal, the Fiber Reinforced Concrete course, and thanks to the Becker Singapore uh, the company 
for um, offering the book using the course to the student who have attended. Now, I start with a brief definition of what federal cement is. Federal, as defined by the American Concrete Institute, federal cement is the type of thin wall reinforced concrete constructed of hydraulic cement reinforced with closely spaced layers of continuous and relatively small wire mesh. And the statement add that the mesh may be made of metallic or other suitable material. So in effect, if you are thinking uh, FRP or whatever, it's included in that little sentence on the bottom. In my book on uh, ferro cement, I added a statement to the definition first by pointing out that the fineness of the mortar matrix must be fine enough to allow a penetration of the mortar when you put it in the, uh, when you force it through the wire mesh. In, in other words, if you have aggregates that cannot go through the openings, it's a problem. And I also added that the matrix may contain disc discontinuous fibers. In fact, in the case of UHPC, for instance, where we use very fine discontinuous fibers, it is uh, very possible to infiltrate uh, a wire mesh systems such as this one. Okay. So again, visually, we are talking about a system with several layers of wire meshes distributed or equally distributed in the section. Visually, if you have uh, in mind, it's a 15 millimeter thick uh, element. So it's a little bit like plywood. And if you end up with something like what you see here on the bottom, uh, one layer of reinforcement and uh, uh, a mortar matrix on top, it's generally called a stucco type of material. So we are not talking about this. We are talking about that. So there is no confusion. Now, uh, more on the definition of federal cement. Again, it's a composite with several layers. So sometimes we call this a laminate. If you isolate one layer with its uh, volume of matrix, you put that one laminate, and then you put several laminates together, you get the material. Well, uh, textile reinforced concrete is included. That is, if we have a polymer type reinforcement uh, used as a mesh system, we can include it. We can include hybrid composite, that is uh, fibers are included in the system. And what is important again, is that the material is less than 50 millimeter in thickness. In fact, if you go above that, you start being at the lower boundaries of reinforced concrete. And then we can use some uh, more reinforced concrete uh, type of standard. And the second uh, observation is that the material is uh, bidirectional. You could put positive bending, negative bending, and you could also use it in two direction, assuming the wire mesh system you use is also equally um, strong in the two direction. An example includes cement board, corrugated sheets, pipes, housing element, boats, and so on. So we are about right with the definition. And now I go to the first patent of Lombo. What is it that you for cement in um, literal terms. And now I want to go to the patent of Lambeau. Uh, Lambeau, uh, a French uh, horticulturist actually, submitted a patent in 1855. It was actually approved in 1855. It was submitted in 1852. And before the submission, he had built two boats out of what ferro cement, uh, how it was defined, 1848, 1849. One of them is still at the museum in one of the uh, small cities in France, Brignol. And so his patent says the following combination of iron and cement, this time meaning with the purpose of to replace wood called fer ciment. Fer in French is iron, so iron cement. And it's a substitute for construction wood. And also he adds it's a metallic grid or skeleton for a boat, a water tank, an orange box, etc. 
Now, what is interesting is that, again, 1848, 1849, he built those boats. He, there are uh, documents to show that he effectively did that. One of them survived. And so this is considered the first patent on reinforced concrete. In fact, uh, any other patent came after that. So I can't move here. How do I go to the next slide? I doesn't respond. Doesn't respond. Yeah. So let's look at the outline of this presentation, please. Definition I just talked about. Uh, history, su su surprisingly, very similarly to uh, fiber reinforced concrete. We also have a dormant period in ferro cement, and I take it to about 1940. Then I consider a revival period started by Nervi. And I will explain why the first period was slow and dormant, primarily due to scaling to reinforced concrete, the cost of the wire mesh, and so on. The second period I call the modern development, started with really Nervi, a scientific approach. Nervi was an engineer, an architect, and a scientist. And there was a very interesting paper presentation by Professor Shurino from Torino in Italy uh, about a few months ago on the contribution of Nervi. And I'll talk with progress with time, that is in the modern time about the matrix uh, leading to HPC. So this will be very short because we covered that. I'll talk mostly about progress in the reinforcement. At the end, I'll conclude with the forest ferrocement model code and some other remarks. All right. So. Well, first, I would like to remark that uh, why Lambeau's idea was a genius idea. In fact, to me, it was a struck of luck because although cement existed since the Roman, you know, Vesuvius, uh, ash, and so on, and although iron rod existed since the Iron Age, many large, and although many large structures like fortresses and castle and temples were built for 2,000 years, no one until Lambeau had the idea to combine cement plus iron together to create a new material. In fact, Lambeau didn't know that this was such a genius idea. He just, as I said, it's a struck of luck. He wanted to simply build boxes for oranges and, uh, uh, or, or for plants uh, in, in, uh, in, in his, uh, um, in his um, farm. And so, uh, nevertheless, he struck this idea, but also it's important to see that it was the right time. There was development that helped him. Uh, if you look, uh, if there is a way to move this thing, to, to move this thing out here, uh, it's in the way of my slide, I'm sorry. Um, in fact, if you look at fiber, uh, at reinforced concrete books, they often will say that the, the first patent on reinforced concrete came from Monnier or from Cognier. So you have to understand the relationship. And I want to talk about uh, particularly their contribution. So at the same time as Lambeau was working on his uh, boat in, uh, in uh, southern France, another fellow by the name of Monnier started building also flower pots for the city, the parks in the city of Paris. Could you put this yeah. somewhere where I doesn't go into my slide, please? Okay, thank you. Okay. So if you look at, uh, if you read about Monnier, you find out that he also built flower pots around, started 1849, so at the same time as uh, Lambeau. So that idea already was, was, was existing, was spreading. However, Monnier later on, continued to study, I would say, as a curious, curious, uh, he was not an engineer, but I would say he, he has the heart of an engineer. He continued to study uh, reinforced concrete or ferro cement, and he was the first to point out that cement concrete is weak in tension, and that the tension region is the preferential location of cracks, and therefore, that's where he needed to put his iron rod. So he was the first to recognize what we know today, 
cement is weak in, in tension. Uh, therefore, that's where we put the reinforcement. And when you look at some of his sketches of uh, a water tank or a box or a pipe, the reinforcement looked like what we would use today um, in reinforced concrete uh, or in ferro cement. Now, another person, another person is sometimes credited for uh, the first pattern in reinforced concrete, and his name is uh, Francois Cognier. Yeah. Francois Cognier was uh, an industrialist. He was not an engineer, but uh, you could say by that, but the time it, he was like a learned person. And very much these people, learned person, could learn uh, some uh, scientific uh, uh, knowledge and they could build houses and et cetera, or build machines. And it was based on their own whatever knowledge and responsibility. So now in 1852, Cognier uh, recognized that cement and, 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 and iron bars, uh, there is a potential for them. And he started himself exper experimenting with uh, concrete and bars and iron bars. And in 53, he built a reinforced concrete house in the suburb of Paris. I'll show you that in a minute. And he called because, you know, he's uh, also, he has the spirit of an inventor. He called the new material, beton armé. Beton is concrete, armé is reinforced. So basically is reinforced concrete. And that, that name has stuck with us now and, and until today. And based on his uh, initial experience of building the house in 1853, Cognier in 56 took some patent and as an industrialist and, and entrepreneur, if you want, he built few large scale structures, the aqueduct of the Lavan near Paris. He built the foundation of the lighthouse of Port Said in, in uh, Egypt. And at the time they were building the Suez Canal and he contributed to several structures along the Suez Canal. So we are talking about between 50 and 19, 18, 1850, 1870, we had quite a few uh, development of uh, concrete structure. So this is the lighthouse of Port Said. It is, the structure itself is masonry, but the foundation is reinforced concrete. This is the house that Cournier built in 1853 the photo was taken in 1998. I didn't have a new one, but since the time, so this, the house was in fact in disrepair, but since the time the French government uh, took over, considered that this is a historical monument and they are remodeling. Okay. So reinforced concrete in a way uh, started with three names, but the basic idea came from uh, Lambeau who put the two materials together. There are other milestones that you have to look at again. This is Burr's view. What was happening at the time between, say, 18, 1800 and 1855? What was happening? First, we know that Portland cement, we know that iron wire, which were treated, heat treated, so to, to make them a little bit more ductile, were available in the range of one millimeter to five millimeter already around 1800. We also have a patent taken by a Frenchman, Henri Foudrinier, who made a hand woven iron wire mesh, which was used in some machinery for the production of paper. So, so these ideas existed. And then we know that uh, starting 1836, a company in the UK, Barnard, Bishop and Barnard, in fact, you see their name three times, Try to set, um, try to sell. They are in the, net, the netting business, in the in the textile uh, weaving and netting business. Try to produce wire mesh, uh, hand handmade wire mesh, and they have three patents: 36, 44, 55. Still, all based on hand weaving. So it was expensive in a way, but uh, they try to get patents. So. This is the background of in terms of wire netting. Now, let's go back to Lambeau for a second. In fact, Lambeau did use 
uh, in his production, he used iron wires. These were about three millimeter to form uh, say a larger grid. And he netted in them, like you would weave in a textile, finer wire, which is about one millimeter. So in effect, uh, Labo did by hand what would a machine do, fortunately, on an industrial basis. Now, between 1850 and 1860, there were some very, very important uh, development. One is uh, the patent was taken by Harry Besmer on producing steel. Steel, by definition, is much more ductile than iron because, in fact, its composition is different. So, in fact, steel bars started becoming available as soon as 1860. And that, as a result, made reinforced concrete so much more attractive. At the time, there was, I guess, a hunger for by engineers or whoever was scientific enough for a material that could be used in roofs and slabs. And so reinforced concrete came as a, as a tremendously good answer to all that. And so steel and reinforced concrete structure took off, took off at a very high rate. And since then, of course, we know. Now, I want to point out that between 1850, the invention of federal cement, and 1890 here, there was no industrial machine that could produce wire mesh. And you could say that for about 40 years, producing wire mesh by hand was going to be not only expensive, but time consuming. And if you wanted to buy from this company that was doing it using hand knitting, it was very expensive. And as a result, the development of federal cement, if you want, was hindered. Reinforced concrete was taking off, steel was taking off, and then federal cement, too expensive, too difficult to find a wire mesh. Now I want to look at this uh, time axis. Uh, 1849, that's uh, federal cement start. I look to, to 1970 in a first phase, and then there is a second slide that shows the next period. On this time axis, I show this period here between 1849, Lombo, and 1940, Nervi. And I would like to explain a few milestones. During this period, above here, we have some application of federal cement. Below, we have application of reinforced concrete, fiber reinforced concrete, research concrete. We all know that reinforced concrete, research concrete, they have led to the largest uh, evolution of construction material throughout the world. But let's go back here to ferro cement. Remember, the idea of the ferro cement initially was a boat. So people try to continue that idea. And if we look at the literature, we find at least two, three uh, attempts to use boats. We have Z uh, Boone use a boat called Zimu. Now it's in, the, in a museum in, in Amsterdam. 1896, that's after we started possibly being able to buy some wire netting. Uh, Gabellini in Italy introduced several boats. And then really nothing was happening. Certainly it was mostly marine structure and perhaps flower pots or something, agricultural application or horticultural application. And then in our World War I, there was a shortage of steel and several uh, states, several countries, including the United States and Canada, decided they will use concrete boats or federal cement boats. So the idea of federal cement boats can be built. So let's scale it on a large scale concrete boat. And if I told you today, build the reinforced concrete boat and you use your experience, you know it's going to be very difficult. The cracks in reinforced concrete can be large. You will have a infiltration of water. So it's very, very difficult. And all what I can say is that these were a tremendous failure. And I'll show you that in a minute. And uh, that brings you approximately to where Nervi started. Let's start at the next uh, slide. This I was several years ago, and uh, the coast of California in Santa Cruz. And one of those concrete boats, hey, it's not a small boat, that's 130 meter long, uh, which was sank at this location and is being used as a, 
uh, to allow marine life to grow and so on. I went to this point and took this picture, but this is one of those concrete boats. And to my knowledge, there are about maybe 15, 20 of them have been built and they have encountered the same fate. That is, you know, they have been sank in different places uh, to promote marine life and so on. Now let's go back here. So this 1916 experience was very bad for Peru cement because it, it was, a, it gave Peru cement a bad reputation. You know, the boats couldn't be used, etc. Then came Nervi in 1940s. In fact, same idea was the beginning of World War II. The Italian Navy didn't have enough steel to build enough steel boats. Nervi wanted to convince them that they can use ferro cement boats. And so he started building his own boat or call it yacht. I show you a photo. And then he worked with professors from Politecnico in Milano, from Politecnico in Torino, experimenting ferro cement, like bending, tension, etc., and came up with a recommendation to use it. So let's uh, move here. This is his boat called Irene, quite large, actually. I'm sorry, the quality of the picture is not very good, but 65 ton, whatever that means in terms of marine structure. And the experiment that I mentioned, he worked with the different university, led to a paper in which he wrote the following. And that, that's a very important conclusion. The fundamental idea behind the new material, ferro cemento, basically ferro cement in Italian, is the well-known and elementary fact that concrete can sustain large strains in the neighborhood of the reinforcement and that the magnitude of the strain depend on the distribution and subdivision of the reinforcement throughout the mass. So basically what he's saying, remember ferro cement is made of uh, several layers of wire mesh distributed throughout and small wire. So you could in effect consider uh, a concrete element, put a big reinforcing bar, same area, cross-sectional area, as a hundred uh, small wires, and the behavior, although the strength might be the same, the behavior is going to be totally different in terms of the strain capacity of the concrete. That's why when you talk about the strain capacity of the concrete, because you have bonded reinforcement in large area, you end up having very small crack width. And this uh, conclusion, in effect, or his observation was demonstrated uh, in some experiment, not only this one, but uh, in some experiment on ferro cement. Where we show that the crack spacing at failure of the structure of the element in tension is inversely proportional to the um, specific surface of reinforcement. That is, the more you subdivide the wire, even for the same area, the smaller the crack width and the smaller the crack space. And now you could realize that, yes, ferro cement, if you keep the crack width very fine, can be used for marine structure. You know, we can coat it, we could uh, control the crack opening, etc. But uh, in fact, Nervi, I mentioned that uh, he's a very famous uh, architect engineer. Based on his experiment, uh, he uh, built this uh, structure, the Torino Exhibition Hall in 1948. Uh, so you have a big uh, convention uh, in, uh, in uh, Torino, and this was the main structure, and all the roof of the structure was made out of ferro cement and ferro cement element. Beautiful structure. Now, why do I have this picture? Well, first is to show that it's a beautiful structure. But in fact, in 2018, I was visiting uh, Politecnico in Torino, where there was a team uh, appointed by uh, the Italian government uh, looking at all the structures that uh, Nervi built. They needed rehabilitation. There was uh, corrosion. There was problem. They have had earthquakes in the meantime, some columns were cracked, and we were member of a commission uh, to e evaluate or give our opinion. So this is Professor Shorino from uh, Politecnico Torino. Some of you may know Professor Marco De Prisco from Milano, Professor Gambarova from Milano also, uh, et cetera. So, but, but we were there to help understand the uh, ferro cement and they wanted to repair these structures. Okay, so let's move. So now it's, uh, you, you can see it from, 
from the exhibition hall 1948, uh, there seemed to have been uh, enormous interest in what Nervi has achieved. And as a result, many, many, many amateur builders decided, hey, if Nervi can build a big structure in federal cement, and he can show that, that you know, the specific surface of reinforcement reduces the crack, we can build boats. And there were many boats built by amateur in the UK, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Southeast Asia, simply without scientific uh, approach, basically talking to each other, saying I'm putting five layers of mesh and I'm putting three millimeter grid of uh, skeletal steel and so on. So the, the interest here led immediately to some development. I'll show you a couple of pictures. And then in 1968, the United Nations Food and, and Agriculture Organization wrote a report saying, you know, effectively, ferro cement should be, is, in, is a good material, should be used for marine structure and agricultural structures. They, were, they had in mind, you know, if you are a water, a water tank, a silo for grains, uh, uh, channels for carrying water and etc. And so there was, uh, I would say, from this point on, with early Nervi's papers and several large structures built, not only the one I showed you, there was, uh, if you say, a revival in the idea of Perosem. And this is the type of boat that were built uh, a little bit during that period with the amateur builder. And you could see some of them, like this one, quite large could be for uh, fishing and, and or a yacht for uh, a pleasure. Now we go to the second period that uh, where again, I have the red axis here is time. And I wanna talk about some milestone on the top and some development on the bottom. So on the top, 1972, the US National Academy of Science produced a report <clears throat> that was of big interest to many people in the community who are interested in ferrocement, in which they effectively say ferrocement should be used scientifically, uh, not only in marine structure, but in, in terrestrial structure, agriculture, and so on, to encourage. In fact, at that time, the US was involved in the war in Vietnam still, and uh, the Department of Defense had uh, used uh, barges, uh, small barges on river, uh, with the Vietnamese to uh, transport grains or material or so on was much cheaper than, than using anything else. So they already had some experience. In 1975, American Concrete Institute um, uh, formed a committee on ferro cement. So we were working, I was, uh, at that time, I became a member immediately. We were working with uh, Professor Cha and so on. In 1976, uh, at uh, the AIT, Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok, there was a center was formed, which was funded by several countries, the uh, uh, International Ferro Cement Information Center. 1979, RILEM had a committee on ferro cement. Uh, IAAAS also had something working on thin reinforced concrete, which was like, like ferro cement. And uh, in 1991, a number of, uh, well, you could say, uh, learned people like me and uh, Professor Paramasivam, who was working here, at, uh, we formed a, a small society called the International Federal Cement Society. Now, the idea was not because we needed a society. At that time, we really needed a code for federal cement, and we couldn't find out any other better way to do it. We had already worked with the ACI to produce a guide, a state-of-the-art report, uh, but SEI was not ready to create a, a code, and we decided well, that's what we want to do. And now if you look at the time, 1991 to the present, uh, many terrestrial structures, the marine structures have been used, and on a larger scale. I'll show you a couple of quotes. Now, in the bottom part, I show also milestones of development that help ferro cement. Uh, we started having FRP meshes and fabrics that we could use in ferro cement glass fiber reinforced, carbon fiber reinforced, later uh, spectra and so on. 1994, I talked last week about, uh, about the introduction of UHPC, so that's the ultra high performance matrix, important for ferro cement because it's very 
thin, small particles, so it can infiltrate the mesh system. In 1998, we have what we call textile reinforced concrete came into the picture. We are using textile produced by machine uh, and made with non-metallic material. In uh, 2000, we had the ferrocement model code that we, meaning the society, International Ferro Cement Society, published. Uh, in uh, starting in 2000, we starting having very high strength steel available for ferro cement. And in the meantime, between 79 and 2021, we had 13 international symposia on ferro cement. So well, things are moving, and and, and ferro cement is being recognized uh, by the scientific committee. Now, I want to mention at this point, it's a good. Uh, uh, the contribution of NUS, several professors at NUS, and I worked with them, contributed to this initial scientific phase of investigation on ferrocement, scientifically, meaning theoretically and, and experimentally. We did with Professor Mansour, and unfortunately, I couldn't find in my file uh, more recent, a uh, different picture. Professor Mansour visited me in, uh, in Michigan in 2008. He was not feeling very well. He was ill and eventually he passed and I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but I worked with him on uh, ferro cement panels for housing. We had in mind prefabricated uh, housing unit that can be made with panels. These panels were bolted. So we had tests on um, bolted connection. We had tensile, uh, by biaxial tensile loading, etc. cetera. Uh, with Professor Paramasivam also, I started, we started working, he started working on the use of ferro cement tanks. All right, here I show you Professor Tan and his family uh, who spent uh, one year sabbatical at the University of Michigan with me 30 years ago, and we have been a very good friend and colleague since. This is Professor Paramasivam as the sixth international Symposium on Ferro Cement in 1997 or 98, I can't remember. This is another symposium that was organized at NUS by Professor Ong and Professor Mansour uh, in, in 2002. So uh, the groups at NUS have really contributed uh, quite a lot to the success of Ferro Cement. And I, I think it's a good time for us to acknowledge that. So that this is again, uh, Professor Paramasivam, uh, Professor Ong, uh, and I have remained friend with everyone. Now, let me talk quickly about evolution of uh, the material for ferro cement. Uh, I, I can talk for a long time, but I'm gonna cover here development in the matrix, development in the reinforcement, and I'll skip up to the code. Okay, development in the matrix, remember last week I covered ultra high performance concrete. Well, that's, I could say also, that's a very big development for ferro cement. Notice one of the thing is that ultra high performance concrete can be made to be extremely, let's say liquid, okay? And if you think the way we build with ferro cement, typically what we do, we plaster, we use a rather viscous uh, or not, not very liquid uh, mortar, we plaster, we force the mortar, such as in this example here and this example, we force the mortar through the mesh. However, with the use of ultra high performance concrete, now we can think that when we have thin elements like ferro cement, look at this uh, particular beam, it have only six millimeter uh, across, uh, you know, width. It is possible if we are using ultra high performance uh, concrete with uh, less than 0.5 millimeter particles to then infiltrate or therefore we can use mold to produce these elements. And that is one new, uh, say, applicable, applicable method of construction for ferro cement. So that's how ferro cement can benefit from UHPC besides the fact that it's very strong and so on. Now let's look at development in the reinforcement. And here I will again, try to give you visual uh, ideas of the reinforcement and one conclusion related to each stock. The reinforcement for ferro cement uh, is mostly wire mesh and that could be expanded. It could be square welded. It could be square woven. It could be what we call aviary or chicken wire mesh and, and so on and improvement on. So, 
these meshes were available in the 1970s, and many of the tests we carried out at that time, 70s and 80s, uh, related to these meshes. And in one single conclusion, when we use these meshes in a ferrocement plate, and we test in bending, remember the bending in ferrocement is positive or negative is about the same. We find that uh, when we put the, you know, about 7% reinforcement, that's the more most when you accumulate your meshes, we can get 50 megapascal modulus of rupture. Modulus of rupture here may, meaning the bending resistance, uh, you made an equivalent elastic bending stress, so you can calculate it like 6M over BA squared. That gives you a quick idea to compare. So now these were the reinforcement we used at the beginning. And then we started having on the market other reinforcement like a polymeric reinforcement. And I divide them in low end, low strength, low modulus, polypropylene, nylon, polyester, and then high end glass, carbon, Kevlar, HDPE, which is spectra and so on. And, and so I show you here the low end. This is a nylon, this is polyethylene. We, threat, we tested a lot in all types of these reinforcements. And by and large, we found out that at least the low end gave us limited uh, performance. Uh, typically, uh, here I read 16 uh, megapascal uh, models of rupture compared to 50 with the steel meshes. And uh, okay, I can't read this part, but that's okay. And then we continue now with the more advanced meshes. Uh, carbon, uh, Kevlar here, you know what it is. It's uh, um, used for bulletproof vest. Um, it's a type of aramid, but, but uh, patented carbon. Spectra, spectra is high density polyethylene fibers used for the meshing. And so these are high performance uh, meshes because they have high strength and high modulus. It's not a low mod. And when we use these systems, and I want to be uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, concise as possible, you could use this system in these, this configuration with several layers. And we found out that all the layers that were in between, uh, naturally because of the bending, but also because of other issues, we are not as effective. These are very expensive. You use carbon or at the time use carbon mesh or spectra mesh, it's extremely expensive. So we found out that uh, because these meshes are difficult to maintain in their position, exactly where you want them, they would sag. And as a result, the, the composite result were not very good. But we found out it's much better to use a system like this with only two meshes, one on each side, let's say Kevlar mesh, or carbon mesh and use a matrix with fibers. And that system gave us about 40 to 50 megapascal bending resistance. So as a comparison, it was a very good uh, piece. And I show you here a typical example of testing. This, uh, the black here is a, a specimen with 1.5% spectra fiber, uh, a spectra mesh, excuse. Now we added, so sorry, I'm sorry, with 1.15% uh, uh, Kevlar mesh, we added PVA fiber and spectra fiber, and you could see the strength increases, the contribution of the fiber, but not only contribution to the bending resistance, because these system, when you use very high, stiff, strong and stiff meshes, you may end up with shear type of failure, not bending, before bending failure, we avoided shear, and you can see here, if you look, with a relatively small amount of reinforcement, if you add in these two, let's say 3.65% total reinforcement, I'm getting about 40, 44 megapascal bending resistance. So it's good, quite efficient, and that's what we recommend we do with these type of reinforcement. Now, in some instances, uh, we recommended, uh, you know, for the, for the mesh, for the fiber reinforcement here, we recommended that instead of having to pour a matrix with the fiber, which is more difficult, we could use a fiber mat. And this is an example where you use a fiber mat and then you could put the reinforcement. It has to be tied, of course. This is an example with Kevlar. This uh, mat is a bit too thick for ferrocement, but I'm showing it since that's what I have. 
in my notes. Now, one other item that came, we observed very quickly. When you look at the cost of federal cement, you find out that the cost of the matrix is really small, five to 10%. The reinforcement is expensive, 45 to 50% is the reinforcement. And then the labor, and when I talk about labor, I'm mostly, when we did this study, we were looking at labor in the US, in uh, the UK, and, and in France, you know, the people with whom I could communicate. And, and so when you look at uh, the labor, I mean, you look at the reinforcement here, uh, so the labor depend on the country where you are, so that we cannot control very much. But when you look at this 45 to 50%, you find out that, uh, we need to find a way to reduce it, not only by itself, but with respect to the labor, because if you have to put several layers of mesh, that's uh, labor incentive. And so the ideas of producing three-dimensional reinforcement, these are steel, uh, as you can see one of them, this is an example where we have two meshes and some uh, steel wool spiral in between. And this is another example. So there were attempt to produce three-dimensional reinforcement. Remember, we are talking about 15 millimeter uh, total distance between the layers. So it's... later on, I worked with the um, Institute of Textile in Aachen, and they were uh, building textile that are three-dimensional. As you could see here, this is an example of glass fiber uh, mesh uh, this is another example. And in between, they have ways. This is the textile machine that produces that. So you could get uh, essentially a 3D reinforcement. So we tried these system. In, and this is another system, very interesting. As you could see, it's almost like the reinforcement of a waffle slab in reinforced concrete. Again, these were using glass fiber on the top, uh, strand, and in between, these were like polypropylene um, monofilament arranged in such a way by the weaving machine so that you end up with a 3D network. And uh, when we tested, let me go, to, when we tested these reinforcement in, in like cement, uh, like uh, ferro cement type stuff, we got 15 megapascal. I remember we have 50, uh, what regular uh, steel meshes do, uh, maybe 20, uh, what, what low end uh, polymeric meshes do. And these didn't give us so much more, although it was so much easier. You just put them, you pour the cement matrix on top and so on. And, and the reason was that we felt that the glass strands were not strong enough. And when I say strong enough, I don't mean the wire, the, the monofilament of glass. So when you, you put the glass fibers together, you attach 200 filament, and the resistance of that, uh, let's say, strand is much less than that of one wire. And so we even uh, suggested that they could use the sensitive system and introduce small steel wire strand. And that's, that gave us significantly better results. But all these systems, if you want, are uh, quite expensive, but available should there be uh, an important application to use. All right, so as a, in summary here for this, we observed that uh, for the 3D textile that we were involved with, the models of rupture was about 15 megapascal. And of course it's, it's good, good enough, but maybe not as we hoped it would be. And there is need for research in this area, obviously, especially if you could uh, get uh, the your steel mesh on top and then use the fabric as a way as a spacer. So I want to mention that uh, sometime in the early to 90, late to 1990s, early 2000, we had some very high strength steel available on the market. And so the first thing we do, we, we will try to use it in some federal cement. And this is an example, this is called the hard wire. Uh, I don't know if you could see the detail, but in this, uh, there are very fine steel strand in the longitudinal direction. In the transverse direction, it's only a, a glass mesh uh, simply used to maintain the strand in, the, in their position. It's almost like the, the strand are glued to the mesh. 
uh, although I don't have the details here to show the, at least the detail of the wire, but the wires were in the up to 3000 megapascal tensile strength. So it's a very, very high strength steel performance that, that you had with this material. Another example, this one is, is uh, produced by Becker called Fleximat. Here you see more detail. This is where the strands are going. And then in this direction, you have a polypropylene, actually, they call it a lino mesh. It goes back and forth to keep the spacing of the reinforcement. We use the system for ferrocement plates and for confinement of column. And we were very happy with the result. And again, this uh, I cannot see uh, on my um, screen, the bottom part, but it was about 25 or 2800 megapascal tensile. In fact, what we did, I want to show you an extreme result. Uh, again, looking at models of rupture, uh, we with regular steel meshes, 50 megapascal, with the others, uh, polymeric meshes, high end, we also are close to 50, low end, we are 15. Uh, but we wanted to find out what is the upper bound. And so we use this type of reinforcement, very high strength. You can see here the testing. Uh, you could see the fine crack. And I want to show you one graph. This is the load, the equivalent elastic bending stress. So basically, it's like the load, the load deflection curve. On the bottom, you have deflection. Uh, this curve here represents, okay, now let me, let me explain first the composition. We have used this uh, very high strength wire mesh up to four layers of it here. And the four layers can, are equivalent to 6.27% 6 reinforcement. So there's a lot of reinforcement. Then we use an ultra high performance matrix with fibers and the fibers 3.5%. These are short fibers because we needed to infiltrate the mesh. So you can see I have here a material that is almost about 9 point, uh, whatever, 7% total reinforcement. But then look at the number. With this material, I'm observing 220 megapascal models of rupture. It's almost like a piece of steel, okay? And so that give us, gives us the upper bound potential of this material. Now on the lower here, you have some other cases, but this would be the curve with only the fibers, like UHPC with 3.5%. And again, you could see where the 50 is, in the 1970s, we could get 50 megapascal with 7% total reinforcement. Here I'm getting 220 megapascal with almost 10% reinforcement. Okay. And to give you an idea what it means, I took uh, here two beam. I'm showing for a comparison two beams. This is a slab, reinforced concrete slab, reinforced concrete box beam, calculated their uh, nominal bending resistance for the maximum reinforcement allowed. And unfortunately, I cannot see the bottom, but I know that I, if I calculated what would be the equivalent elastic bending stress, I get something like 30 megapascal or 33 megapascal to compare to 220 that we observed in the previous slide. Uh, again, this is quite a, an achievement for federal cement as an upper bound. Now, as a summary, the steel wire mesh uh, how did the uh, reinforcement evolve over time? Uh, the steel wire mesh, which was already available in the 1940s, low end polymeric meshes, we were not successful. It was too, in fact, they could be successful in a very lightweight matrix, but they were not successful in normal strength, ferro normal weight ferro cement. High performance polymeric meshes, they were successful. We were able to uh, obtain up to 50 megapascal models of rupture. High strength steel meshes. I think we could still say that uh, steel or high strength steel remain the most competitive material for ferro cement. And of course, now with the extent of 3D textile and fabric and fibers, I think there is more work to do in that area uh, in terms of the maximum models of rupture achievable. I, in fact, believe that eventually it is almost better to use a textile as a spacer between two meshes of uh, two very high strength steel meshes, uh, you know, as a, as a way to achieve the, the best material. So I wanna quickly here show, uh, I have a few minutes, 
I want to quickly show the range of application of ferro cement that you probably have seen some and maybe other uh, are on the way. It started with small structure, you know, biogas digester, a small water tank, a structure, quite a, a larger water tanks at the top of building. And then, you know, again, some agricultural structure. This is like a grain silo, a small house. Uh, these houses were built in uh, Cuba up to two story high out of ferro cement uh, panels that were prefabricated and brought to site. This is a, a new, new, relatively new um, application uh, used by uh, Mr. Milenkovic, and I'll show you where um, uh, he has built many, many of these houses, uh, low, co low cost of, of production. Uh, here, maybe you see an example. This is, this is a typical number of them. And what he did, he um, developed this frame out of steel. So this is prefabricated coming into the site. Everything else is simply wire mesh and three millimeter wire that he ties everything with, covers the, the thing with wire mesh, and then you end up with a very nice um, house, let's say, or it could be shelter, or it could be warehouse. He has done that on a large scale. This is a, a large warehouse, as you could see. He used similar thing for a stadium, for a sports, like a basketball stadium and so on. Uh, other structures of ferro cement, you may have seen a large board. This is Le Tumla. Uh, unfortunately, has been retired uh, re recently in the French Martinique. It has been built in the 1870s. So uh, this is the Saiger. Um, uh, landmark in Lampung, Indonesia. The roof is out of ferro cement. This is the Yambu Cement Company's uh, entrance, which used the roof of that structure here in ferro cement. This is the latest development. We don't have many application ferro cement, but this development, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Cultural Center in uh, Greece was presented at the Ferro Cement 13 Symposium. 100 meter by 100 meter. The top, all ferro cement, uh, call them slab, used to also hold solar panels. So a very interesting application. And the span between the columns is like eight meters. So it's quite impressive what they have done. Uh, this is uh, today the, uh, the news are on Ukraine, but I got this uh, photo from a development in Ukraine, uh, it's a hull, and it's a thousand, uh, again, I, I don't have the bottom part, but it's a thousand ton. It's a, the, the whole structure is a ferro cement uh, hull, okay? A thousand ton used also for river transportation in Iraq. So we do have a potential for large application. And now, in the would like to talk about quickly uh, this slide about the evolution. Remember with Lambo, we started with the small boat and the flower pot. Then we moved more marine application. Then we went into terrestrial application, especially after the um, UN Food and, Drug, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization suggested ferro cement. So we went into housing, uh, marine pontoon, cladding, a potential new application. Well, you know, if you want any thin structure that is uh, resistance to penetration, bulletproof panel, for, in for instance, uh, blast resistant confinement for shell, penetration shield with very high strength ferro cement and UHPC, these could be used, it's expensive, but they can be used. So one more item, where do, we, do I see the logical evolution of reinforcement based on current advances? Well, first, High strength, high modulus reinforcement. It is in fact, especially if you're starting to use UHPC, which itself has a modulus of 50 gigapascal, you want your reinforcement to have significantly higher modulus uh, than UHPC. And then hybrid combination, such as in this case where we use uh, fiber uh, in, a, in a spacer or in a mat, and then your steel reinforcement or could be. Uh, Kevlar or anything. And then the development of 3D textile, perhaps 
with the 3D textile because the limitation with the fibers, you know, if you use glass fibers or polypropylene fibers, it's not good enough. And when I discuss with the Institute of Textile in Aachen about carbon fiber, um, it, they are much more difficult to work with. And although they would be the most attractive in terms of 3D reinforcement, they were mostly concerned at these connections where because carbon fibers are extremely brittle that they create some problems. I foresee something that I call self-stressing as we can develop reinforcement made out of shape memory material that kind of shrink when you subject the structure to radiation or heat. So imagine you could put the shape memory mesh, let's say in a federal cement, wait till it's hard, then subject it to heat and the mesh tries to shorten, creating free stresses. So this is an area uh, we can look at. In the case of the matrix, ultra high strength is durability as well, ultra high strength and durability that UHPC uh, with microfibers. And again, uh, the idea of some self-stressing with expensive cement instead of uh, regular cement. Okay, I talked about everything in the last uh, five minutes or three minutes I have, I would like to talk about the code, the federal cement model code. And this is really a, a, a somewhat a personal story. In the 1990, you know, in the 1980s, as I mentioned, uh, ACI, of which I was a member and uh, Professor Paramasivam was a member and Professor Shah was a member, we, we work together and develop a guide for federal cement and a state-of-the-art report for federal cement. But when we try to get ACI to develop what we call a code for federal cement, that's so much more difficult. Uh, it was, okay, I want, I heard all the, the reason why they couldn't do it. But imagine uh, ACI is responsible for reinforced concrete code. Other entities are responsible for, I guess, United Building Code, uh, uh, ASTM standard comes up with some code related to their material and so on. So we couldn't convince ACI to come up with a code for federal cement. So we decided as a group of researcher and uh, professor, let's develop a code and put it on the market so that people can use it. And uh, to make the story short, we did. We developed a code, we published it in 2001, 90 pages. It tried written like a code for ACI, but we called it building code recommendation for federal cement. On one side, you have a column giving the prescriptive um, language. On the right side, the column explained the prescriptive. So it was like a code and commentary. And that was available. And we were actually very happy because we thought, that's all what it means now for people to start using ferro cement. And, and uh, we were extremely disappointed because anytime a person, uh, an engineer, even using this code or ACI, try to build a structure, uh, they face um, you know, regulation code, the building inspectors say, well, I, this is not internationally approved, et cetera. And they wouldn't approve. And in fact, by talking to my friend who was building these uh, houses, Mr. Milenko, he said, in effect, he convinced the building authority, the local building authority, where he's building these houses, by almost telling them, I take responsibility if anything goes wrong, I'm responsible, I'll pay for it. Then they allowed him to use federal cement. So it's a very difficult situation. And we have, the Federal Cement Society has tried to make this code available almost free of charge, just use it so that people can take advantage. Uh, I, take, I take an example. We have had two earthquakes in Haiti in 2010, 2021. And it would be so easy if we can allow people to build their own little federal cement house or hut or whatever it is. And the material that we can furnish are, are so little. I mean, wire mesh and, and some wires, anybody can, can learn the technology. But as I said, it's so difficult to get that approved by the, by the local authority. And so when I look in this concluding remarks, I, I would like to first summarize my own feeling. Uh, Ferro cement is more versatile today than at any other time. 
from low tech to high tech. Low tech, you know, anybody can build with it. From steel mesh to FRP mesh, from 2D reinforcement to 3D reinforcement, textile and fabric. For one type reinforcement to hybrid combination with fiber, from structural standalone material to support and repair and so on. The most important advances today, the high strength and 3D reinforcement that we can achieve, UHPC class matrices, I talked about last week, larger scale marine and terrestrial structure. Larger scale marine, you know, um, up to maybe 30 meters uh, should be very possible. And it could be very attractive for inside, inland river transportation. And the most critical need remains for me, the code, the federal cement uh, model, the, the, the having, Oh, the most critical for me is to have an internationally recognized organization such as ACI or EDC to recommend or rebuild, re, redevelop a new code, but to have a code, official code for federal cement. Now, I, I conclude by saying it, it is unfortunate that the lack of funding or endowed funding, in fact, I'm not sure it's funding as well as self interest, you know has been very detrimental to the full progress of federal cement and as a result has not served the branch of society that could most benefit from it. That is the public and more particularly its less fortunate component such as self-help and amateur builders. So if, 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 we can, if we can have a, a simple code that anybody can follow uh, and that is recognized or uh, signed on by uh, scientists uh, like some of us, then somebody uh, who wants to build on his farm a little hut or a little water tank should not be kept from doing it because of some code that doesn't exist. Okay? That's why I want to conclude my uh, presentation. Um, like I, I'll skip on this one. And thank you very much.